Well, good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. I hope it is well with your souls today. Uh, before we begin, just to know that the, the flowers up here on either side of the altar are uh, presented by Tom and Sue Britton in memory of David Alt. So we thank you. Thank you. Uh, just remember there's a blood drive coming to First Church on July 23rd from 11 to 4. If you would like to donate blood, uh, they're, they're recommending that you call ahead or get online and make, a, and, and reserve, make an appointment. Also, the youth are still looking for uh, frames for their uh, evangelistic artwork that they're doing. And also, next week, starting on the 18th to the next Saturday, the 25th, uh, my family and I will be on a much-needed vacation. Uh, we had asked your prayers that that can happen, that the states don't get shut down on us or something. Um, but we'll be away. And uh, if you need anything, call the office and they'll make arrangements if there's any emergencies, anything like that. Up here also on the altar, we have some, well, we did have <laughs> some rosebuds. And one is for Emma Grace McDaniel, daughter of Seth and Nicole Daniel, who is the granddaughter of Wayne and Ann Doherty. So congratulations. Also, um, Laurel Elaine France, the daughter of Sean and Jordan France, and the granddaughter of Roger and Juanita France. So congratulate them. Downstairs, we also had uh, two bud vases for Daxton Richard Cotner, the son of Brandon Cotner and Kelly Steinbacher, the grandson of Corey and Dan Cotner, and Timothy Donald Morse, the son of Tyler and Suzanne Morse. So God is blessing our church with new life. And we, I ask that you would pray for that new life and those families as they, they begin another adventure. Even if you already have a child or 10 children, that next one, it may seem more familiar, but it's, it's a journey, right? It's a different adventure because they're all different. So with that, um, I just say, I hope it is well with your souls today. And let us begin worship in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
Would you please join me in your hearts in our choral call to worship? can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Tis a melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. I love the Christ who died on Calvary, for he washed my sins away. He put within my heart a melody, and I know it's there to stay. a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. It will be my endless theme in glory, with the angels I will sing. It will be a song with glorious harmony, when the courts of heaven ring. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Will you join me in our opening prayer? Great Spirit of us all, we lower our heads before you and confess that we have too often forgotten we are yours. Sometimes we live our lives as if there is no God and we fall short of being credible witnesses for you. Therefore, we seek your forgiveness. Please give us clear minds and open hearts that we may witness for you in this world by loving others as you have loved us. Amen. And now will you join me in a time of silent prayer. God Almighty, you loved us so much that you sent your one and only Son, that whoever puts their faith in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. Whoever puts their faith in him has their sins forgiven, and they are granted through grace eternal life. My friends, 
in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And now, let us say the words that our Lord taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is a, just a great day, and it's time I ask you, what are you thankful for? What can you give God joy for? One of the things that I am grateful for is just your presence here. Some of you I have not seen in months, and so it is a joy for me to see you. But what are your joys? What are your thanksgivings this morning? Tom. Excellent. Excellent. We Grateful for that. Praise God. Anyone else? The rain. Although it can be a nuisance when it comes, it is de definitely needed, right? And it's refreshing. It cooled things down quite a bit. Someone else? Yes. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Yeah, we give God thanks for a beautiful morning. Anyone else? All right, so your crown just keeps getting more and more jewels, right? Pretty soon you're not going to be able to hold your head up. <laughs> we give God praise for new life. Anyone else? Well, friends, God is good to us. He's going to be good to you today. And when you, when you recognize that, just lift a hand and say, Thank you, Lord. Amen? This time we come to a time in our worship that I believe is very valuable and very important. We are unable to pass the plates for our offering and we ask, we have two boxes back here that as you come in or leave, if you would put your offerings in there. Um, but there is something important. There's something uh, special when we respond to God and we bring ourselves before his altar. And so this morning for our offering time, I ask that you just sit quietly, meditate and pray, and ask yourselves, and ask God, actually, ask God, Lord, how can I be an offering to you this week? How can I serve you this week? Lord, all we have is yours. Every good gift is a gift from you. And so we thank you for those gifts. But Lord, how, help us to, to see how we can use those good gifts in, in order to reach out to a neighbor, to reach out maybe even to a stranger, to our church, to you, as, as we seek ways to offer ourselves in service to you. All of this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, Roland is going to bless us with special music. begin with me. 
Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. With God, our Creator, children all are we. Let us walk with each other in perfect harmony. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be the moment now. To take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. To take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. We now come to another special time in worship, and that's where we open our hearts and bow our heads before our Lord. It's special because we all have these, these times in our lives that are challenging. We all have temptations that, that try to pull us away from God. We all have worries, anxieties, things that stress us out. And the most important thing we can do in times like that and with those things is just place them at the foot of the cross. Place them at Jesus' feet and then walk away from them. So often we come before the Lord and we, we lay out our burdens, but then we pick them back up again, stick them in our pocket or strap them to our back once again. But we need to just lay them there, trusting that he will deal with them and give us that, that easy yoke to carry. We come in this time of prayer in the name of Jesus because there is something about that name, isn't there? There's no other name like it. And, and so we, we come, put our faith in that name, in that person, and trust. Will you join me? Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after Jesus, 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 there's just 
It is a name that rings throughout history. It is a name that is holy, a name that is above all names. And within that name, there is power. And when we call upon the name of Jesus, he will hear our prayers. He will answer. May not always be the way we want it to be answered, but it is what the Lord God Almighty knows is best for us. It may not seem like it at the time, but Lord, but, but we, we go through that, trusting in this name. Lord Jesus, today we, we call upon your name for all who are hurting. Lord, for all who are broken inside, for all who, who fight addiction and, and can't seem to run fast enough or far enough away. Lord, we pray for those who are suffering from illness, from chronic pain. Lord, this morning we pray for, for Jenny and we pray for Ardeen in their battle of cancer. And Lord, we pray for anyone who has cancer today. Lord, we pray for Bill as he is dealing with some health issues and we just pray that you would work things out in his favor so that other things can take place. So bless him with your presence. Lord, we pray for Father Glenn and the Catholic Church as well as they've, they've been, they're shut down for a couple weeks as they step back and, and just make sure everyone's okay. And Lord, we pray for our church. May it continue to grow even and, and, and despite this virus that keeps us from all gathering together. Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for our, our leaders, Lord, that they would have a heart of, of coming together, a heart of unity instead of division. That they would want what is best, not only for them, but for all people, all races, all, anywhere. And only you can help us do that. Only you can bring us together. Only you can heal the, the illnesses we have. Only you can restore relationships. Only you can grow your church and unite a country. And so in all of this, we pray in your precious name, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Amen. This morning, our, I'm going to open in Scripture from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 6, beginning with verse 12. I was told, King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obedidom and all that belonged to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obedidom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with a linen ephod. 
So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with sounds of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw the king dancing and leaping before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and offerings of well-being, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed food among them of all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people went back to their homes. David, too, returned to bless his household. But Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants' maids, as any vulgar fellow might shamelessly uncover himself. David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me in place of your father and all of his household to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord, that I have danced before the Lord. I will make myself yet even more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in my own eyes. But by the maids by whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor." And from Psalm 87, we find these words. On the holy mount stands the city he founded. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. Among those who know me, I mention Rahab, Babylon, Philistia, and Tyre, and Ethiopia. This one was born there, they say. And of Zion it shall be said, This one and that one were born in it, for the Most High himself will establish it. The Lord records, as he registers the peoples, this one was born there. Singers and dancers alike say, All my springs are in you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Friends, if we are truly going to be the church, the body of Christ, if we are going to truly do any meaningful ministry, then we must sincerely love God and love others as Christ loves us. As Paul told the Galatians, the only thing that counts, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love, through love. One way we show our love for God is by obeying his commands. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. Another way, though, we show our love for God is through worship, like we're doing this morning. And if worship is one of the ways we show love for God, we should really know what worship is. So let me begin with a definition of worship found in the Harper's Bible Dictionary. It says, worship is an attitude and acts of reverence to God. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for worship means to bow down. The posture of bowing down is a sign of reverence and respect, vulnerability, and submission. In the Middle Ages, when one king conquered another, the conquered king was, was to kneel before the conquering king as a sign of respect and submission. But it was also, this, this, this action also put the, the, the bowing person in a very vulnerable position. Down on the ground with his head bowed, he was defenseless. 
And the conquering king could choose to offer life or the king could take life. If he offered him life, then that conquered king was to serve the conquering king. God is our king. And when we worship God, we should do as if we are bowing before God. God is our Lord. We are submissive. And, and being submissive, we are to serve him and only him. Worship can then be summed up as service, reverent and submissive service to God. Therefore, in the sense that worship is service, then all that we do for God or in the name of God is an act of worship, whether it's on Sunday morning or for the other six days of the week. That's why Paul, that's what Paul was talking about in Romans 12, 1, when he said, Therefore, I urge you, in view of God's mercy, to offer yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. Your spiritual act of worship. We are to offer our lives to the service of God. And, and our lives and all that we do is our spiritual act of worship. You see, worship is so much more than the one or two hours that we give on Sunday morning. Each day when we get up to go to work, we should say, I'm going to worship. Each day when you get up to, to do your household chores around the house or to go to the store, you should say, I'm going to worship. Every time that you go out to visit someone or, or work around the house, you should be saying, I'm going to worship. Worship is not just something we do on Sunday morning. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and body. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. If we show our love by obeying and worshiping God and our worship is bound up in service, then when we love others, when we meet other people's needs, when we serve other people, are we not worshiping God? When we go on a mission trip, and we work in 90 degree temperature and sleep on a hard elementary school floor and run paintbrushes up and down walls and hammer nails into things, we are worshiping God. Whenever we, we help with family promise or like next week's Vim week, we are worshiping God. When we collect things for the Salvation Army or, or Sunlight House, we are worshiping God. When we help a person in need, a neighbor, a stranded motorist, a, a homeless person, when we visit a shut-in or the sick, when we show compassion and empathy, when we earnestly listen to someone else's troubled heart, when we share the gospel, when we stand up against racism and stand up for social justice, we are worshiping God. When we go to work every day and we do our jobs with integrity and with Christian character, we are worshiping God. To the, Colossian, or to the Colossians, Paul said, whatever you do, whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. Whatever you do should be an act of worship. And this brings us to the next aspect of worship. Christian worship, my friends, should be characterized by joy and thanksgiving. You know, I've thought, and I thought about this this week, and I can't think of a single scripture reference that tells us to come and worship the Lord with gloom and despair. I can't think of one that says, come worship the Lord with bitterness and hate. There's not a single reference to worship God begrudgingly or complacently. No, every reference is to come worship the Lord with thanksgiving, praising his name, joyously singing of his wondrous works and love. So I ask you, are your daily acts of worship, are your Sunday morning acts of worship characterized by joy and thanksgiving? Perhaps the answer is more obvious than we think. Perhaps the question can be answered by the amount of time we spend sharing our joys and thanksgivings. Or perhaps the question can be answered by by simply listening to the way we sing our hymns and our songs? Do we, do we sound 
passionate and, and joyful or robotic and just uninvolved. We're just singing it because the bulletin says we're supposed to stand and, and do this right now. Regardless of how you answer that question, the real question is how can we make our worship joyful and thankful? And I hope to give you some direction in that as we go forward here. We started out with the definition of worship, which said that worship is acts of reverence to God. Reverence being honor, praise, esteem, and love for God that manifests itself through acts or loving service to God and to others. And we've covered that. But the first part of the definition, if you remember, said that worship is an attitude of reverence to God, an attitude. I would dare say that most people don't wake up on a Sunday morning and jump out of bed and go, oh boy, I can't wait to get to church and worship God and, and sing his praise and be in his presence. Most people, most people come because they feel they should, and, and there's a part of them that wants to be there, um, and they want to see their friends. They come willingly enough, but not always full of excitement and expectation. They come with an attitude many times of, okay, pastor, get me in the mood. I hope, I hope you pick some good songs to get me in the mood to worship. But my friends, that's not our role. As clergy, our role is to, to uh, preach the word and lead worship. Yes, excellent, excellently and, and vitally. But your role, your role is to prepare yourself to worship, to receive the word. Your role is to prepare yourself to put God first and fully, fully focus on God and nothing else during this time. Your role is to come with the at the attitude of reverence and expectation of finding the Lord and sharing in that and being lifted up. However, that's not always easy, is it? It's hard to put our problems and our stresses and our anxieties aside. It's hard to come to worship and, and forget about that husband or wife or, or child who will not come with you. It's, it's hard to forget about the argument or the disagreement we had last week or even last night. It's hard to forget the hurtful words that were said to us. It's hard to, it's, it's hard to stop wondering where that son or daughter is who didn't come home last night. And trust me, I know. I think one of the hardest things for pastors is to figure out how to participate in worship while leading worship. I mean, it's so easy to, to just come in and pick up the bulletin and simply work through the liturgy step by step. You, you concentrate so much on leading worship that you forget to participate in it. And we come to worship with the same, many of the same worries and burdens and anxieties you do. Am I going to get sick this week? You know? And, and you know, we, especially if we have children, we get our kids up, especially when they were little. You know, we get our kids up and fight with them to go to church. Our kids did the same thing yours did. I don't want to go. None of my friends are there. It's boring. I don't like the music. And then after we finally get them to understand they're going, then they walk out of their room dressed in something completely inappropriate for church, and we have another go around. And after threatening to strangle our kids, I'm supposed to walk in here and prepared to lead you in worship. We know what it's like. We worry, is this the week I'm going to get COVID? You know? And, and it's, it's not always easy to come prepared. I get that. But let me assure you, it is possible to put all of that aside for a couple hours a week and focus all all of our attention on worshiping God. We can do it. Earlier, we read about David being in a moment of pure, uninterrupted worship. David had not long before been anointed as king over the nation of Israel. He had defeated 
the, those who were still loyal to King Saul. Then he defeated the Jebusites who were occupying Jerusalem. And he made Jerusalem the capital city of Israel. The Philistines immediately challenged him and attacked. But David and his army, they defeated them. Then David went and he brought Israel's national treasure, the Ark of the Covenant, back to, to Jerusalem. And as they did, they offered sacrifices of thanksgiving and they sang songs and shouted praise. And David, well, David, he danced. He danced with all of his might and, and he danced all the way to Jerusalem. The only thing on his mind was worshiping God and not even his... his his wife's complaints about his style of worship or what he was wearing, or in his case, what he wasn't wearing, could distract him. And my friends, that's how Sunday worship should be for us, full of energy, full of excitement, full of expectation, full of passion, and focused solely on God. And although it's difficult, for a couple hours a week, we can do that. We can set it all aside. But what about the other side of worship? The worship that is ongoing, that occurs during the week as we go do our jobs, as we live our lives, as we serve other people. It can be hard to joyfully worship God daily when we don't like our job, when we don't like the people we work with when we don't like the conditions we work with, if we feel we're not being fairly compensated for our work. It can be difficult to joyfully and thankfully worship God in our daily lives when we want work, we need work, we're desperate for work, and we can't find it. It can be difficult to worship God daily when we can't work anymore and we question what is our purpose in life now that I'm retired or that I'm unable to work. It can be difficult to joyfully and thankfully worship God when our, our bodies and minds no longer work the way we want them to and when we live with chronic pain or, or chronic illness or a life-threatening illness. Am I right? That's hard. Well, for some more advice and guidance and some some encouragement, I'd like to turn to our psalmist today, specifically the sons of Korah. The sons of Korah were descendants of Korah, a Levite priest who led an unsuccessful uprising against his uncle, Moses. The Korahites became the temple singers and were in charge of worshiping or of the worship music in the temple. In Psalm 87 that we heard earlier, the sons of Korah sing of the future kingdom of God, the new Jerusalem. Specifically, they are singing about the Lamb's book of life and those whose names will be recorded in that book of life. They end their short song with these words, The Lord will write in his register of the peoples, This one was born in Zion. And as they, they, as they make music, they will sing, all my fountains, O oh Lord, are in you. This scene is, is that of a musical procession, a parade coming before the throne of God. Just as David sang and danced his way into the old Jerusalem, one day every single one of us is going to dance our way into the new Jerusalem singing, All my fountains are in you. Sounds amazing, right? But what does it mean? What does that mean? For more clarity, we have to go back to Psalm 84. Here the sons of Korah sing of God's living presence in our lives as being our greatest joy. The greatest joy we can have in life is that God, Almighty God, wants to live in our lives. He wants a relationship with us, and He is present with us every single day. And, and, has his, and his presence helps us to grow in strength, and in glory. They sing, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul, it yearns, it even faints for you. My heart and flesh cry out for you, the living God. Further, they sing, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, is in you, who have set their hearts on a pilgrimage as they pass through the valley of Baca. They make it a place of springs. 
or fountains. They dream of being in the divine presence of the glorious God. They yearn and they cry out for it, but they're not there yet. They must wait. They must wait in this world. And so they wait with a reverent attitude that this life that we are living is a pilgrimage to the courts of God. A pilgrimage they make through the valley of Baca. Scholars aren't sure if Baca was a real place or not, but the word Baca means weeping. And so the valley of Baca may be a metaphor for our lives. Lives that have struggles, lives that have pain, lives that have hurt, lives that have tears, lives that have death. Lives that at times feel like a barren land. But as they pass through this valley of weeping, this life, they make it a place of springs or fountains. Now, this is an important piece of this. Who makes this life a place of springs and fountains? It is the people living there. And how do they do that? By checking their attitude. Instead of focusing and dwelling on the trials and troubles of this life, they put their attention on God. And while dwelling on God, they see God's goodness, His faithfulness, His grace, His mercy, His love, His forgiveness, and His beauty all bubbling up out of the foundations of life like cool, refreshing water flowing through and over a dry and desert land. These are the springs that they make. Yes, their lives are hard. Yes, their health is failing. Yes, they are hurt. And it's so easy to dwell on these things and complain about these things. But instead, they place their attention on the good things, the things that refresh them and give them new life, fountains of God. And it brings them great joy in the midst of sorrow. It helps them to dance in the midst of strife. And it makes them thankful in barren times. It is the attitude and acts of worship that enable them to earnestly sing, Lord, all my fountains are in you. Friends, joyful and thankful worship is not easy. We have to work at it. The pressures of everyday life persuade us that to, to focus on the here and now and our troubles and forget about God. That's why worship, what we're doing this morning, is so important. That's why it's important to come every week or as often as you can. Because for a small time, it takes our eyes off our current worries and our troubles and gives us a glimpse of God's holiness and allows us to look toward that future. Our sorrows, our failures, our disappointments, our, our, our tragedies, our health issues, they're very real. But a better day is coming. This too shall pass. And we will joyfully dance and sing before the throne of God. Amen? But until then, until then, we are to see our lives as a pilgrimage. We're on a journey a pilgrimage to the courts of God. And like the psalmist, let us make springs along the way by by being aware of God's goodness and His mercy, His grace, forgiveness, love, strength, and beauty. Allow those things, those good things, to refresh us and strengthen us for this pilgrimage that we are on. You know, in these days of COVID-19 and wearing masks and isolation... In these days of partisan politics, in these days of social media and and race problems and, and anger and hate, it's easy to see our lives as a dry and desert place. It's easy to see a negative and depressing existence. But Paul encouraged the Philippians and he encourages us, saying whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, then think on such things. Because these things are the springs from God. These things are the fountains that that flow through this dry and desert land, this valley of Baca. Friends, may our lives be a living sacrifice. May our lives be acts of loving worship. 
as we pass through our own Valley of Baca, let us make springs, let us make fountains, and joyfully sing, all my fountains are in you, O Lord. Amen? Amen. This time, I'm going to invite the praise team to come up and lead us in our closing song here this morning. This is a, a song probably many of you are not familiar with, but I encourage you to listen to it, hear the words, hear what they're saying, and, and you know, behind your mask, sing. <laughs> All our fountains are in you. This dry and desert land, I tell myself, keep walking on. Here's something up ahead, water falling like a song. An everlasting stream, your river carries me home. Let it flow.
Friends, as you leave here today, know that God is present in your life. May that be a joy to you. And, and as you go forth, no matter what your problem is, no matter what the ache in your heart is, look for those things. Look for that new life, that grandchild, that, that voice. Look for that rainbow. Look for that, that yearling or, or that butterfly or whatever it is. Look for those, those, those joys things that are pure, that are good, that are righteous, that are excellent and praiseworthy, and think of those things. And springs, fountains, will flow up out of you, and you'll be able to sing, Lord, all my fountains are in you. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you. My friends, go forth in peace, making springs flow up in this land and lovingly serve one another. Amen.